From Classical WETA in Washington, we take you behind the music. In this episode, I'm joined by Classical WETA's Nicole Lacroix, and we're diving into one of the most triumphant and recognizable works, Beethoven's Symphony No. 5. With musical examples, there's a lot to explore, from the infamous premiere, new instruments in a symphony, and even Morse code. Nicole, I'm sure you might agree, that has to be one of the most iconic motifs in all of music. It is so significant that they used it as a signal in World War II, a signal of victory. That's right. Well, they get that because it it was often played in radio broadcasts um, before special bulletins because, I don't know if you know this, that da-da-da-da, that is the same rhythm as... V in Morse code. That is V for victory. Now, Nicole. I knew you would know that because you're into Morse code. As nerdy as that might be. (laughs) It's so much fun. Now, let me ask you this. How far does this coincidence or rabbit hole go? What is the opposite of that rhythm? Do you know what that is? No idea. That's B. Is that B for Beethoven, Uh. maybe? (laughs) I don't know. It might be there. You know, there is a rabbit hole. I bought a book. While I was reading up about this, I bought a book that is devoted to the first four notes, Beethoven's Fifth and the Human Imagination, 304 pages by Matthew Guerrieri, and it's fascinating. Oh, I can imagine. It, there's so much to get into, and some of it, maybe it's it's too far, or either way, it's just so much fun to get into because there's always a little bit of truth into it, right? Absolutely. Uh, Some people think, you know, the famous story about fate knocking at the door, because that's what two of Beethoven's assistants, uh, Schindler and Ferdinand Ries, said that he told them that was fate knocking at the door. Somebody else said, well, no, no, it was because he was in love and he had been uh, distressed because the lady didn't love him back. Okay. And this is my favorite, Carl Czerny. He's known to piano students everywhere for those awful exercises we all had to suffer through. He said that it was actually the chirping of a yellow hammer bird that Beethoven heard when he was walking around in the park in Vienna. That one, I've heard that little bird. I've heard it. It it is very close. I will give it that. Close, but no cigar, if you ask me. Right. So at this point in the early 1800s, Beethoven's kind of on his own, or rather in uncharted territory when it comes to symphonies. Before this point, the big symphony composers, the popular ones like Mozart and Haydn, to name two. Haydn's final one was in 1795, just 13 years before Beethoven in 1808. That's like 2007 compared to today in 2020. So it's actually not that, not that far off. And Beethoven's doing new things with the symphonies, going into, as I said, uncharted territories. And this was also a pretty difficult time for Beethoven, actually, before he wrote this. In our Life of Beethoven episode, we talk about the Heiligenstadt Testament, which you read, Nicole, actually part of in that episode beautifully. And it was basically a testament, a will that no one read until after he he died, just talking about the depths of despair that he had experienced in realizing and experiencing this permanent hearing loss. So coming out of that period, this is when Beethoven is sketching and writing from 1804 to 1808, this symphony with this renewed purpose and just desire and need to compose. Also, Beethoven was a student of Haydn's. That's right. And I read somewhere, I thought it was very funny, uh, where they said that prior to Beethoven, Haydn had written 104 symphonies, but after Beethoven, (laughs) that if you wrote more than eight symphonies, you started uh, uh, worrying about your funeral plans because nobody survived writing nine symphonies. That's true. So 104 to nine, that tells you how much the symphony under Beethoven grew to um, universal proportions. And the premiere of his symphony number five is extraordinary in both kind of tragic, hilarious ways in that he premiered this in 1808 in what must be one of the most remarkable classical music performances of all time. Let me describe this to you, Nicole. It is a four-hour concert 
in the freezing cold. The heat was broken on the night of another very famous concert, and it was all and it was almost a complete disaster. There's so many interesting things that happened in this performance. We had the premieres of symphonies number no. five, number no. six, a new piano concerto, his choral fantasy, which is a kind of precursor to the symphony number no. nine, and other excerpts and arias of Beethoven. It was kind of like. I mean, it was a tour de force for the musicians and for Beethoven as well. There's some background to that, which I had never really understood. But apparently the only times that you could put on an orchestral concert was during Lent and Advent. So before Christmas and before Easter, that's when, according to the church, you had to close down the opera theaters. So there was a very small window where you could have these concerts. And uh, because Beethoven was a freelance artist, this was his source of income. It was a benefit concert for him. So he was negotiating with the people of the theater Under Wien, which was a relatively new theater, beautiful place and large. Uh, He was negotiating with them to have this concert And that was a difficult negotiation. Meanwhile, on the very same day, as you said, John, Salieri is having a benefit concert for widows and orphans of musicians. And he took all of the good musicians to his concert. So he left Beethoven with a bunch of basically amateurs, like a a community orchestra. That's right. And at first, it sounds like, wow, Beethoven, that's a pretty awful thing to do. There's a charity concert here. But it was, as you said, All the operas were canceled at this time. This is the only time you could do these kinds of performances. And it was a great detriment to Beethoven because all these musicians, if they were not playing in that musical society charity concert, they could be fined. They were required to be there. And he was left with these either amateurs or semi-professionals who weren't part of that union. Now, I have some letters here describing some things that happened in this concert. One is from Ferdinand Ries. He describes it saying, Beethoven gave a large concert in the Theater an der Wien at which were performed for the first time the C minor and pastoral symphonies, that's numbers five and six, as well as his Fantasia for Piano with Orchestra and Chorus. In this last work, at the place where the last beguiling theme appears already in a varied form, the clarinet player made, by mistake, a repeat of eight bars. Since only a few instruments were playing, this air was all the more evident to the ear. Beethoven leaped up in a fury, turned around, and abused the orchestra players in the coarsest terms so loudly that he could be heard throughout the auditorium. Finally, he shouted, from the beginning. And I guess when they did it again, it was, we all kind of went okay. But a lot of musicians, we've all been there when a conductor gets a little too too much, and you say, I'm never playing for that person again. And that's what people said about Beethoven. But Ferdinand Ries finished it saying, this letter, they swore that they would never play again if Beethoven were in the orchestra. This went on until Beethoven had composed something new, and then their curiosity got the better of their anger. <laughs> they always come back. Um, it paints a portrait of Beethoven that I really hadn't considered before as... Mm, a foul-tempered, rather egotistic gentleman, not, you know, just a, a creative genius who was misunderstood and who had this this terrible thing of deafness happen to him, but someone who, who had a humongous ego and a terrible temper and was a very difficult personality. It doesn't end there. He slaps a child at this concert. And not another, on purpose. Not on purpose, but only, I guess, to Beethoven. Louis Spohr, um, another colleague, describes the concert. Beethoven was playing a new piano concerto of his, the fourth, but already at the first tutti, forgetting that he was a soloist, he jumped up and began to conduct in his own peculiar fashion. <laughs> at the first sforzando, like a huge moment with the orchestra, he threw out his arms so wide that he knocked over both the lamps from the music stand of the piano. The audience laughed. And Beethoven was so beside himself over this disturbance that he stopped the orchestra and made them start again. Seyfried, worried for fear that this would happen again in the same place, took the precaution of ordering two choir boys to stand next to Beethoven (laughs) and to hold the lamps in their hands. One of them, 
innocently stepped closer and followed the music from the piano part. I mean, who can blame him, right? You want to see what's going on. <laughs> but when the fatal sforzano burst forth, the poor boy received from Beethoven's right hand such a sharp slap in the face that terrified he dropped the lamp on the floor. And then he goes on to say that the other boy was more cautious and ducked and just missed Beethoven's swinging arm. And he said if the audience had laughed the first time, they now indulged in a truly Bacchanalian riot. <laughs> you, that's not something you would usually think happening during the premiere of his Fifth Symphony in different pieces, but still, that all happened for real in one place at the same time. And we've turned him into a god, but somebody else said you know, there can be too much of a good thing. <laughs> That's true. It's four hours long, this concert. It's freezing cold. There's no heat. And this is not gentle music. This is music that kind of hits you over the head. One thing I found interesting was that the reaction to the Fifth Symphony and they're hearing this thing for the first time. It's not like they've heard it on the radio or in their CDs forever and ever. They're hearing it for the first time. The reaction of the Viennese was, wow, okay, that was that was extraordinary. Uh, Some time later, a couple of years later, when he premiered it in France, they got it. Oh, yeah. Because, and one old veteran stood up and said, vive l'empereur, because they understood what it was about. It spoke to them. Yes. And this, I kind of played maybe in Beethoven's favor. All these crazy things happened at his concert that it was kind of a spectacle and the music was almost overshadowed. It wasn't, it wasn't a very poorly received performance. It was just kind of like, well, yeah, I guess that happened. That was crazy. But a year later, when he published it, um, E.T.A. Hoffman, I'll put it on the show notes page, wrote this extraordinary review of the work. And it is a great symphony. Many might say, is it his best? Is it kind of the Mona Lisa of Beethoven's symphonies? Everyone knows it, but maybe it's not his absolute best. I absolutely love it. I know that for sure. Going back a little bit to before the actual premiere, I think that it takes living through, you know, challenging times yourself as we are now with the pandemic and so many different social movements going on, that it gives you a sort of a, a an inkling of what it must have been like for Beethoven living at that time. It was a time when the world changed. It was almost like a, a nuclear reaction, the end with the guillotine of the old regime and the aristocracy and old ideas and the birth of the new ideas about freedom and liberty and uh, the brotherhood of mankind, all of those philosophical ideas that were so close to Beethoven throughout his career. Just think of the Ninth Symphony, the the writings of, of Schiller and, and the, the philosophy of Kant and everything, all of this. He's 18 or 19 when the revolution breaks out in France. This is, and you know, he's in college and he's thinking of freedom of man and let's get rid of the aristos and hello there. And he's got a big ego anyway, so he wants to take part in this. Plus then Napoleon, who's the same age as he is, and Napoleon is coming and, you know, how he famously uh, revolted at the idea of Napoleon becoming the emperor. All of this is internalized. All of this he expresses in this heroic symphony. It's definitely heroic. It's like this triumph, all those things you're talking about. And I can't imagine for Beethoven, who at this point was already becoming, for years, pretty reclusive, right? He was not going in, out in public a lot because he was very anxious about his hearing. And then to go out and to do this performance, which is supposed to be your big benefit and income for the year, and to have it go like this, I'm sure was absolutely traumatizing. Right. And he was the soloist in the piano concerto, and he was conducting the, the two symphonies. So yes, it must have been incredibly difficult time. I mean, there was even a part where the French troops were, were coming in and he had to hide in the, his brother's basement. I mean, these are, this is an incredible time to come up as a genius, <laughs> look around the world and say, what can I do? I'm going to take fate by the throat and I'm going to 
shake out some earth-shattering music. I will say one thing I wish we had an account of is the musicians, but also their spouses. I know when they go home, my wife's a musician as well. When I come home from a concert, it's always, how did it go? Hmm. When she comes home, I say, how did your concert go? I can only imagine what these musicians had to say to their spouse when they come home. Well, how was your concert, honey? <laughs> well, you won't believe this. <laughs> Beethoven ended up hitting a kid on accident, and it was and, and not understanding fully the impact that symphony would later have. How they didn't set the theater on fire with all, <laughs> all those candles That's a miracle. going. <laughs> and let's get into all of these kind of interesting and important moments of the Fifth Symphony right after this. Classical Breakdown is made possible by Classical WETA. Join us for the music anytime, day or night. To listen live, just go to our website, classicalweta.org, or download our app. It's free in the App Store. So Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is kind of his biggest orchestra yet. He has the usual strings and winds like flutes, oboes, clarinets, and bassoons. And also he has two horns and two trumpets, but he also adds, for really one of the first times ever, three trombones in the last movement and also a piccolo and that huge contrabassoon in the last movement as well. It's a huge orchestra. I read somewhere that because of the, the theater under Wien being new and larger than, say, some aristocrat salon, he was able to amplify his orchestra and the sound. The other thing that I read that the instruments at that time were much more delicate, much more difficult to play than the instruments, than our modern instruments. So having all those horns and the trombones and trumpets and everything must have been uh, kind of challenging to play especially with difficult music that yes. he wrote and at the rather fast tempi that he insisted on. Oh, yeah. And there's some moments we can show in a little bit of the brass, for instance. They don't have valves on them, the horns and the trumpets. And remember, if you're sitting there for 25 minutes... <laughs> and you're frozen. Your fingers are cold. The intonation can get very messed up very quickly. And also, as you said, these instruments are delicate. Strings also, of course, don't do well in this very, very cold environment. But They're gut strings, too. Right. He adds these new instruments, but right from the beginning, we know that iconic motif... <laughs> And we know how it kind of goes and evolves for a little bit. We can actually go get into one of the things you just mentioned about being difficult, sort of. This is kind of a little bit of a, an appetizer. What I love is how it uses some transitions from section to section throughout the symphony, especially in the first movement. We get this horn fanfare. And it's like a nice pivot point, isn't it, going from one thing to another. Now, remember that little melody? Put it in your back pocket. We're going to uh, need it later. There's something, there's a moment after this, Nicole, that I think is extraordinary. I wonder what maybe your imagination, what it does for you. The orchestra is cooking, things are moving, and then suddenly, as if there's a storm and the clouds part or, or something, there is this little cadenza, this little solo moment for the oboe where they basically have control. They can play it as, the, as they would like. And it almost sounds like, to me, Beethoven's furiously composing, and then all of a sudden he's kind of taken out of the moment, and he sees a bird outside, maybe that yellow hammer you were mentioning before. I'll tell you what it brings to my mind. First of all, you're setting up with with the the introduction, pa 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 pum. You're you're setting up that sort of celebratory French revolutionary festival like the Marseillaise, Allons enfants, de la patrie. So you're starting out that sort of warlike. We're going to take up our arms and and beat anything for the revolution. And so there's all this war and this activity and, and so forth. 
And then there's maybe this child or this woman saying, have mercy, the humanity. It's the human spirit is being sort of beaten by all of this noise and this um, uh, drumming all around it. That's how I hear it. I like that. I really, I really, I can see that. And it is, it's like war. And then we're suddenly brought out of, you know, when you're so hyper-focused in on something and then you get this larger, maybe bird's eye view and you see this humanity. Now, just a moment ago, I said, put that little idea, that little horn fanfare in your pocket because it comes back, but it comes back in a different key. Now at this time, horns don't have valves. So you might have a crook that you insert into your instrument that makes it play, for instance, in a certain key. Here, an E-flat horn. E-flat major has the same key signature as C minor, so it all works out. We're starting the symphony in C minor. Right. Now, the horn is in this, it can play in that key very, very well, but it doesn't have valves, so you still have to put your hand in very far to get some of the notes in between the notes that are natural. So you're trying to, you kind of have to force the instrument to play notes that are out of its own design. It's hard to explain, but when it comes back into a different key, perhaps in C major, the horn cannot play that same fanfare with that same kind of sound. The sound is going to be a little more nasally or crunch because they're having to manipulate their hand and stop the air a bit to get that pitch to sound. So Beethoven had a choice, either have them do that and have it sound not the way he wants or give it to someone else. And he gives it to the bassoons. which sounds like the perfect instrument to give it to. If you give it to flutes, it doesn't have the same impact, and it just kind of works. Even though today, of course, we can play all the notes we want because we have all of the technology and valves, but we still keep it as Beethoven wrote it. That's really interesting. I had no idea. Oh, yeah. If he maybe thought ahead of time, he could have have the horns rest for a long time to prepare another instrument, as I think he does in another symphony. But... That wasn't possible here, so they just he just went with this. The first movement is a lot of fun. It sets us up for the rest of the symphony. The second one is especially, especially beautiful. It's one that I didn't think too much about until until recently. It's got two different themes, and then each theme is varied alternatively. Well, let's go ahead and listen to that first theme because it's to me it's this kind of beautiful little kind of march. Whenever you put that kind of figure with a pizzicato, kind of like a march, a slow march, and when you put it in three, it takes on this whole new ethereal kind of purposeful atmosphere to me. There's almost a hymn-like quality at the end of that passage. That's what it is. You're right. It's like a a hymn-like quality that returns. And this theme in variations, it's not something you expect in a second movement of a symphony. Now, this is his fifth. He's already done plenty of things to... Um, change the idea of a symphony and, and to change the form. But it's quite, I don't know, for me, it's quite striking. It's almost like he said, well, you know, I've done the the funeral march, <laughs> so I'm going to sort of change the character of it. I mean, I've done the funeral march in other symphonies, so I'm going to sort of change the character. <laughs> and he certainly changes the character here when you kind of expect it to be very peaceful and everything, but it, it gets quite huge as well. Besides the trumpets, there's one instrument that really sticks out. That's the timpani, which I also don't expect to be kind of marching along in a second movement. But timpani wasn't 
used a whole lot like this in symphonies before Beethoven. Um, Haydn did, of course, and you hear it in, in some Mozart as well. But Beethoven puts more demands on the timpani. He gives them more parts, not just playing with trumpets and kind of fanfares. And at this time, technology is also very primitive for timpani. Now in a concert, if you watch a timpani player, you can see them retuning and changing the pitches within a few seconds. They can do it pretty quick. They do it all the time in a single movement. At this time, that was not a thing because these things were so unwieldy that trying to change the pitch would just... It would just be so inaccurate, it was just not worth doing. But Beethoven has them change pitches, not just in between movements, but also within a movement at this point. And that's something that just, again, Beethoven pushed the technology with the piano, and he's also pushing instruments in his symphonies as well. Speaking of the theme and variations that you were mentioning... There's some lovely counterpoint happening there, right, with the flute above. I wonder who he learned that from. Perhaps Haydn, who taught him counterpoint, and Beethoven wasn't very happy about it when he was uh, in his 20s. Yeah, he was a bad student. <laughs> he was not. It was worth it, but you're right. He was he was not the greatest student of, of Haydn. But I think it, the lesson stuck, obviously. And with the third movement, you'd expect before Beethoven in the times of Mozart and Haydn, you would expect a nice little minuet and trio to just prepare us for a grand finale fourth movement. But Beethoven does something a little bit different, and it starts with this kind of mysterious opening. we hear that rhythm da 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 from the beginning v for victory not b for beethoven but v for victory returning in the horns in a very 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 obvious way now nicole remember the horns they don't have valves at that point in that recording the horn players do have valves so the horn the notes all sound even as they're going down in pitch but if the horns players are playing natural horns, those without valves, those notes don't all have the same even, clean timbre. It changes a little bit, a little more nasally, a little bit softer. I think you'll hear in this example with the natural horn. You have to hear it a, a few times sometimes to, to really hear it, but the sound really, really changes. And these are phenomenal horn players. And I should say, these are extraordinarily difficult instruments to play. Now, this gets pretty fast, and it goes kind of in the face of a minuet and a trio. And can you imagine being this musician, premiering this symphony with almost no rehearsal, and then you have to play extraordinarily fast passages? Beethoven has drama everywhere in the symphony. Even if it's a very gentle lyrical passage, it's always dramatic. It's part of this overarching story that he's telling. And that story, honestly, is the same no matter who's playing with it. Um, a friend of mine who I lived, also, I also lived with in college, is a percussionist, and this was in Boston when we were studying at NEC. And it was very common all the time you'd get called to play a gig with a local college or a local 
amateur orchestra. Basically, you're just coming in at the last minute for the concert to fill in because they might not have enough people. Or again, these are amateur groups. It's for fun, but they also want it to sound good and have some people play the really difficult parts. He went to it and he did the concert, and we were having dinner. And I remember this. I was asking, "Oh, how did it go?" Of course, we always ask, "How did your concert go?" And he said. Oh, you know, it was at, at so and so place, so it was just、um, you know people doing it for fun, and、oh, something happened. The bassoons they couldn't play this, they couldn't play this part. Oh, it's kind of you know what we would talk about. And then he said, "But you know what? It was Beethoven. It was still Beethoven. It was still the Symphony Number、no. Five." Wow. And he said, "Everyone stood up, everyone screamed." He said, "It was amazing." Why do you think that comes through, even with uh, uh, not ideal situations? If the music is right, if the message is right in the music, it's going to come through. I think it's just one of those universalities of either music or poetry or any kind of literature, even paintings. You see early paintings by Van Gogh, Van Gogh, and it's like, oh, there's a lot of you know this going on here, but it's it's still so impactful. So. We are trying to figure out ways of getting into the symphony so that we can understand it intellectually. But I think what you're saying is it's a gut reaction first. Oh yes, definitely. Everything else is just a way of appreciating it even more. And that's why, all of these years later, we still hear his number five in concerts. Maybe a little too much, but. We always go back because we want to see. We want to hear. Is it going to be a little bit different? And if we always have that gut reaction of this is just beautiful. You know, one of the latest、uh, performances I heard was with the National Symphony, and、uh, John Andrea Nazeda was conducting. It was at the sort of a pop venue、um, at the Anthem in Washington, and it was very fast. And a lot of people were complaining that it was fast, but. That's the way Beethoven wanted it. He went back,、uh, you know, and he premiered it. The metronome had not yet been invented, but several years later, when it had been invented, he went back and put metronome markings on all his pieces. And what he put for this piece was 108 beats, and that's very fast. That's very fast.、Uh, Some people, like Pierre Boulez, take it so slowly, like you know, half of that. But that changes the character of it. It adds to the、um, the drama, the passion, and the urgency of it because it, it's an urgent message. Fix the world now <laughs> is basically what he's telling us. <laughs> and it's it's about the message. Going back to the whole Morse code thing, there's a saying. Get the message through. Don't get through the message. So it's don't just play the notes. Play the music. Mm-hmm, That's mm-hmm. the idea. And with Beethoven, it's so difficult at times, but it's it always has that impact. You know, even going back to that beginning, which gets us into this world with with no introduction. In the first measure, there's an eighth note rest before it starts. So it goes. <gasps> Pa 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 pum. So it's almost like you're doing <gasps> and diving into the cold water. Or, oh yeah. Yeah. And when you play it, you play that first note like an upbeat. It's going somewhere. It is not the destination. And the destination that he brings going into the fourth movement is、oh, something that is fantastic. And it's something he did kind of in the ninth, right? What we call the Mannheim crescendo. If you listen to the what is a symphony episode, the development of that. This is how it gets from the third movement. Into the fourth movement, where all of those instruments that we haven't heard yet, like the、uh, trombones and contrabassoon and piccolo, that's when they come in, and this is how it happens. We hear that theme so many times in this movement. It is so triumphant. It is just one of my favorite moments. We have another one of my favorite moments. Really, is this glorious moment for the horns. That this is the great thing. Find recordings of this symphony you've never heard before, because you're going to discover new things. 
Some recordings have this horn part exactly how I want it. Sometimes it's totally, totally lost. And it's just a matter of, again, just finding different recordings, finding what you like. Here is this moment I'm talking about with these with these horns. That's very nice, right? Sounds great. But this is what I really, really love about finding different things. I love the grit and the overtaking power that two horns can have for an orchestra. And you can hear that in this recording. What I love with that, one, the horns are just... It's like this beam of sunshine coming through. But then you have the almost like a stampede, the timpani just rumbling right through towards the end. And you don't get that in all recordings. That's what I mean by finding what you like. What is the difference between the two recordings? Well, one, the one we just heard, you hear the pitch is lower. And that is because they're playing at the intonation that would have been, or the tuning rather, that would have been used in Beethoven's time. So it's lower. And then for modern orchestras, they play at our modern intonation. So it's we're all pitch is always rising. Our ears get used to something, and then we always push it a little sharper over time. And where we just heard before that, that's kind of where we are now. And this is also one of the first times we ever hear the trombone in a symphony like this. Apparently, there was a composer who wrote trombones into a symphony part. Um, I think the year before, I think it was a Swedish composer, but really, I'm sure that's true. But this is the one where it kind of set the new standard where trombones, which were mostly used in sacred music and in church, are now used in secular music and with, with symphonies. And he makes them wait the whole time. They come in on a very, very high note, the first trombone player. But the way he brings them in again, to me, it reminds me of how Schubert would then later use trombones in his own symphonies. Uh, later on. But I like this moment here where you can really hear the trombone coming through. And that's what I mean by this is the symphony that had impact. Because I think in Schubert, I think it's nine where he uses trombones. And it's just like that where they have a statement and then there's the strings coming forth. Then another statement. And it's It's showcasing that power. Of course, the trombone is technically, it is the loudest instrument in the orchestra. It is piercing. Even then? Even then, I'm sure. It would be horns, trumpets, and um, trombones. Although the trombones were a little smaller at the time, I'm sure. It it can peel the paint off a wall. You do not want to be in front of someone if they play at full volume. You know this because you're married to a trombonist. That's true. That's very true. (laughs) So your house is unpainted. (laughs) Oh, yes, practically. The fourth movement has another moment like the first with the oboe, I think, where we're kind of taken out of the moment. And it's just, it's refreshing. It lets you, I guess, you know, have a nice transition or something. But I think there's something here also as there was something with the first movement. It takes you out of the moment. It's like that same thing pulling back on a different view. And we have there at the end, da, 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 that theme coming back in. That's woven through the whole symphony, except for the second movement, I guess. Yeah. I mean, some, I think there is a kind of middle ground here because some people say you can read it into everything where it's, I hear them, you hear that da, 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 da everywhere. And some people say it has nothing to do with anything whatsoever. I think there's a middle ground because although that is a common rhythm da, 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 dum, to, as we said, a pickup leading into something, you can't deny all of the moments like with the horns and with, with it right there, especially in the finale as it's wrapping everything up. It is a foundation of the symphony as well. Because it's so propulsive. It takes you from one place to another. Absolutely. And 
Beethoven brings us the piccolo for the first time, or maybe someone else did before, but this is the one that had impact, bringing the piccolo into the symphony for the first time. And again, listen to recordings, because sometimes the piccolo can be can be lost, but it it's hard to miss it in this section towards the end. And it's that rhythm again. And so you got to wonder why? Why did he choose a piccolo? What, what brought that into his mind? Maybe it's the bird again. <laughs> Maybe it's the bird. There is a moment where it comes back later on, and in some recordings, it's it's very clear, and it reminds me of Papageno from mm. Mozart's Die Zauberflute, and yeah, I just love it. And it's it's a different sound. It was something that people heard before, but it was one that Beethoven may not have really ever heard well at all because his hearing you I believe he was trying to lose the high pitches first so at this point in 1808 the piccolo although may have been it may have been mostly lost on him he still found it important for this and that kind of brings us to the end of the symphony doesn't it a symphony that seems to take a long time to finish It is an amazing piece because we're talking 1808, and it is still as modern now as it was then. You think, oh, the Fifth Symphony, everybody knows it, how uh, almost hackneyed. But when you start listening to it, really listening, and uh, seeing what other people have thought about it, it becomes an incredible world. You know, like the question we were just asking, why did he put a piccolo in, in the last movement? Why? What was going through his mind? Was he thinking of something concrete? Or was he thinking, hey, you know, I know somebody who plays the piccolo and he needs a job. It, it, getting into the the mind of this incredible genius is, is just fascinating. He's one composer that I would at times add with Bach. So basically, I have this thinking where when you listen to the music of Bach... I don't want to say it's perfection, but when you're listening to these solo works by Bach, there's it's almost as if the music was never composed. It was just discovered and then it's always existed. Bach takes away the notes that he didn't need and left what was there. And it's perfection. You can't... Every note is there. If you take one away, the whole thing falls apart. And for Beethoven, it also kind of applies to this symphony where you're listening to it. A lot of other symphonies, you can hear it and say, oh, well, they could have done this here. They could have done this here. This transition could have been done this way. But with Beethoven, and even with listening to that piccolo, it's like, well, no, it had to be that. There was just nothing else. He was like a sculptor taking away rock and leaving us with this. And it's just the structure of the whole thing. It's a struggle with Beethoven where he says he's going to you know, take fate by the throat. And that's the feeling you get. He's kind of shaking that sculpture into <laughs> into submission. I was also thinking of the Tchaikovsky Symphony Number no. 5, which is also based on the idea of fate and that has a motto that goes through all the movements and it goes from darkness to light, just like, you know, minor to major. But that is such a different piece. I don't it couldn't have been written without the the Beethoven, but the Tchaikovsky is a personal coming to terms with fate. Uh, it's one man uh, yelling against destiny and then finding a way through it. But with Beethoven, it's universal. It's mankind, just like in the ninth, it's mankind coming to terms with life, trying to figure out a way through, trying to beat at the heavens to be a hero and to conquer, you know, the, the difficult situation that we all find ourselves in, or the, the mystery of life. That's a very good comparison, because Tchaikovsky can depict absolute despair, but it's that personal despair, and Beethoven is that mankind struggle that we go through. 
and how the symphony, when it ends, it's like it takes forever to end. But every time I hear it, it's like, well, there's no other choice. It's perfect. I can't, you can't add another downbeat. You can't take another one away. It's just how it needs to be. And that's why it has the place in, in the culture that it does. Well, that's all I have for Beethoven's Fifth. Do you have anything else? This has been a remarkable experience. It has. To, to delve into this and to, to learn a little bit more about this extremely difficult, choleric uh, man who was, gave us so much and who was such a genius. Well, thank you so much, Nicole. I'll put on the show notes page some recommended recordings for everyone. And again, my favorite may be the one you hate the most. Sometimes it's good to figure out what you hate because then you figure out, well, what you love in the music. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown. For more information on Beethoven's Symphony No. 5, visit the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org. And make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. If you have any ideas or comments, send them to classicalbreakdown at weta.org. I'm John Banther. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown from Classical WETA. Classical Breakdown.